Hello everybody. Hi. Hi. That makes me even feel more like a teacher. So I'm Charlotte Vincent and I'm the artistic director of Vincent Dance Theatre. And uh, welcome. What do you think you're here for? I can't. <laughs> what? Who said, put your hand up. Sorry, that's a very teacherly thing to say, but I, there's so many of you I can't see. What, what did somebody say? A lecture. A lecture. <laughs> okay, what do you think we're here for? Oh, crikey. No, we're not doing that. What else? <laughs> what, what, what does anyone else think we're here for? To learn. To learn. Oh, I love you. What's your name? Jane. You can come again. <laughs> okay. What else? What do, you, what do you think we're here for, guys? Why'd you turn up to a lecture? Or talk? Because <laughs> you're told to. <laughs> yeah? Because you're told to for your coursework. So are you all taking notes? You're going to use your mental capacity to hold on to questions for later? Well, that was my fault because I didn't know what they were allowed to say. Can that be brilliant? Do you want to take notes? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but on the caveat that I don't just watch a load of you with your noses in your paper because if I feel that, I'll just go to the pub <laughs> and you can just talk amongst yourselves. So I know. Yeah. Okay, has everyone got a pen and a piece of paper? Or a big device on their laps that can take electronic notice? Yeah. Right, what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do, is talk a little bit for a little bit, and then what would be really good for you to get the most out of this is to spend half an hour chatting about some of the things that I talk about. And by that, I don't mean please don't be mute. So if you're taking notes, take them with a view to coming back to me saying, what did you mean about that? Or what? Or that sounds interesting. I'd like to do some of that. Or you did what? Or do you know what I mean? So it's an active dialogue rather than me just talking at you because um, I, I don't find that very interesting. I'm going to talk at you for a bit, but um, we need a bit of exchange as well, if that's okay, because then you'll get more out of it. So the first thing um, that I'm going to say, which I've already said, is that I'm Charlotte Vincent and I'm the Artistic Director of Vincent Dance Theatre. And this year, this March in fact, we are celebrating 21 years of running the company. Did you know that? No. Yes. Okay, well Caroline will get some little thingies later that show you. We'll, we'll send you away with a little brochure thing that shows you the activity that we've been doing for, for marking this anniversary. It's a pretty arbitrary anniversary, I and mean, we could have done 18, we could have done, we did do 10 actually. Um, but for me, it also marks a moment in my career where I'm thinking about changing how I work, and I'll get onto that later. I've been doing this thing called leading a company for 21 years, and it started in this very building with Harry Theatre, who's a Sheffield born and bred uh, dancer. He's actually a clog dancer. Um, and we made a duet together. Uh, in 1994. How many people were born in 1994? Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. <laughs> 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 Who was not even an embryo at that point in time? Oh, oh God. No. <laughs> that makes me feel so old. <laughs> I wish I hadn't asked that question. <laughs> anyway, so um, Vincent Dance Theatre <laughs> is a company. You don't need to shh, I can do the shh thing. Um, Vincent Dance Theatre was formed in 1994, okay? and has been funded regularly, not regularly, but have been regularly funded by the Arts Council ever since. Which, if you know anything about the funding landscape, is quite an achievement in itself. But I've also made a lot of work over those 21 years. There was a flurry in the sort of early 2000s where I was making a project, a big project every year. I'd like to say at the beginning of this um, talk that I'm a feminist, and I will talk more about that later. We make work, it's original work, and we tour it nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. We're currently exploring a new model of touring that isn't schlepping around everywhere in the country, and I'll talk to you about that, and if you've got questions about that, if any of you want to become makers, we can talk about that later as well. I make collaboratively devised dance 
theatre. It's not just dance. It's dance theatre. I could call it live installation, some of it. I could call it film work. I could call it dance. I get very, very irritated when people call me Vincent Dance Company. Because for me, that word is really important in the work that I make. It's an interdisciplinary work. It's made collaboratively with people that I invite in to work with me. I don't dance anymore, I'm too old and arthritic. But for the early ages, uh, for the early 10 years, 15 years of the company I did. But I choose the people that I work with and some of the people that I've worked with have worked with me for 15 of those 21 years. And three of them are Polish performers, Aurora Lubos, Patrycja Kujawska and Janusz Orlik. And Aurora's been with me for over 15 years now. So I'm interested in long-term relationships with performers that contribute from their heart and their soul into the devising process. And I don't work with people that aren't prepared to lay it on the line with me, because that's what I do, and that's what I expect from the people that work with me. And I can talk more about what collaboration is if you're interested later. Um, the work that I make somehow tries to, and this sounds a bit pretentious, but somehow tries to transform my life experience into art that is then shared, that may or may not have resonance with other people. My aim is to move people and make them think. Okay, that's our tagline now. If this was our other logo, it would say moving people and making them think. Because for me, it's not just about people moving, it's about moving you. And again, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But to begin with, over to my trusty uh, <laughs> assistant and administrator, Caroline Holloway. Just, um, this is an introduction to 21 years, 21 works. We hope if technology doesn't fail us. that I made called Motherland. Did anyone see that? Yeah? So you'll um, remember the girls in their pants <laughs> and the electric guitar that Aurora couldn't play before we started the project, but could play by the end of it. Um, so what continues to drive my work um, is a contemporary approach, collaborative approach, cross-disciplinary approach, and a curated practice that moves people and makes them think. And I am very clear that being an artist takes work. It's not a God-given gift. It's not privilege. It's not something that you deserve to do. It takes work. And, and that I, after 21 years, have sort of finally recognised that I might be on a bit of a lifelong journey and that I am an artist and I should just get on with it, really. Um, I feel compelled to make work, which is why I make it. And that's what drives the company, which is a mechanism in and of itself and uh, how I am and how I work in a studio with my collaborators. When this drive and curiosity stops, I will stop making work. I'm clear that my work is not therapy, but I'm also clear that it has some psychodynamic aspect to it because I mine my personal autobiographical experience and feelings to create something that hopes to affect other people. And that's only a word that I've started using recently. I'm reflecting back over the works that I've made, that each of those pieces that I've just showed you sort of marks a moment in my life. If you were to ask me what Testron marked or Broken Chords marked, I could probably tell you who I was married to or who I was going out with or um, what I felt like or where I was living or what was the impetus, personal impetus, to, to make that piece of work. Um, and I'm hoping that because I believe the personal is political and the personal can be universal, that if you get the crafting right, what your experiences can translate and move other people or at least affect them in some way. What I really dislike is dance that's just moving wallpaper, that really gratifies the people in it, but has absolutely no relevance to anyone else uh, watching it or even on stage with the person that's flinging themselves around. So I'm really clear that um, 
in my work, I'm interested in um, movement having meaning, and I don't necessarily mean literal meaning. Uh, I work a lot with metaphor and image, and actually some of my work's really aggressive and dark, and some of it's very lyrical and beautiful. And I think what the trademark of the work is in the press and with people that come see it is this idea that you're sort of on a roller coaster, you don't quite know what's going next, what's happening next. Um, and I like that, I like sort of shaking an audience out of complacency because I think a lot of dance work is just movement that fills up a space for an hour and then we all go home and we praise the vanity of that movement and I'm not that interested in that okay so as dancers you need to ask yourself am I being vain am I just dancing for the sake of it do I have anything to say and have I found the most appropriate language to say it those are the questions that I always ask myself so I work from the inside out and what I mean by that is that I don't work from the outside in. We have a range of um, technical dancers in, in the ensemble. Some are ballet trained, some are contemporary trained, some aren't trained at all. Some are visual artists, some are uh, musicians, some are performers. Don't tend to work with actors because they've got a very particular way of not being normal on stage. Um, and that is something that dancers struggle with as well. Have any of you seen any dance performances where dancers are walking in what they think is a sort of natural way? And it looks the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. So we do a lot of work about trying to be normal when you're on stage. Um, strong conceptual starting points and an ensemble collaborative process that uses structured improvisation as the mainstay of my process um, is, the, is the way into making work. That I then, now on the outside, compose and craft and distill into something that has a really specific form and a really specific meaning. Okay, so the way that I work is there's much play in the studio in the early um, few weeks of, say, a 10-week devising process. And as the process goes on, if I'm making a middle-scale show or a small-scale show, it gets um, more and more finely tuned until I'm going, no, breathe in there, step there, take your eyes that way. It's that detailed. So everything that you see on a stage that I've made is absolutely detailed. Um, but it started from an enormous amount of freedom that the performers have, the collaborators have, to play... Um, within the, the sort of framework that I've set up. And sometimes that can be very confusing for the dancers because they think that they've got all this freedom and then I start distilling it down, working out what it is that we're saying, which bits work, which bits don't. We can work on, say, a duet for two weeks and then chuck it if it's not doing the job for the larger whole of the piece. So I am clear that to abstract the body completely and to dance with dead eyes is to dehumanise the performer, okay? A glance can say more than a whole phrase of movement. I really believe that. I'm interested in our lives being reflected in the art that I make. I look for people to be normal on stage and then do extraordinary things that are all the more believable because we believe they're real people on stage in the first place, not abstracted beings. So in my work, people generally play a heightened version of themselves. Uh, and that draws us in and makes the performer seem real and present and not vain and distant and other, which is what I see in a lot of dance, uh, contemporary dance work. So I lead an ensemble and a staff team and a technical team and guide a board of directors, and that's what it takes to run a middle-scale company. It's not just me in the studio having fun. There's a whole structure, there's a whole machine, and if anyone's interested in talking more about that, I'm happy to do so. Um, as I get older, my creative team gets older. We're a generation and we're ageing together. And we're working a little bit differently now than we were 20 years ago when I was um, a little bit older than you guys are now. The impetus remains the same, to discuss issues such as gender equality, to look up, to use partnering and improvisation at the basis of crafting work, and to make um, find meaning in movement. Those things haven't changed over 24 years. My main skills, I think, that I bring to, to the work are as a composer of space and people in space, and objects in space, and because I design the work and have done for a long time, uh, the design of the space, so itself. So my work uses found objects from the real world to locate us somewhere that's recognisable rather than abstracted. Does that make sense? So the people are not abstracted and the world isn't abstracted. I would never make a piece that had, you know, blue cloth swathed over the, the background and some baubles, you know, since Christmas show, sort of rolling around on the floor in an abstract manner. It's just not what I'm interested in, okay? Because for me, I don't know how to read that space. 
if I've got a pile of soil or a ton of slate or 150 chairs or a table or a kettle, something real that I understand where it comes from, suddenly I can locate the human being in an environment that makes more sense to me. That doesn't mean that everything I make is domesticated. It means that I, it's a found object, it's a real object, and often for me it's a used object, so it's not new. I would probably never make a piece with this table in it because it's plastic and horrible. I often have um, objects that have a, a long history, vintage objects. So I've used ropes and chalk dust and rubbish and soil and real trees and chairs and tables. And I aim to manipulate the response through this landscape with dramaturgical clarity. And again, if you're going to make work, try and work with a dramaturg because they help you clarify conceptually what you're trying to do. So Vincent Dark Theatre identifies with movement, both in, the, in, in many senses, with three senses of the word, kinesthetically, through the act of moving, making movement, and facilitating movement in others, and politically, as a movement of people working together to effect change. And that's where the feminism and the desire for gender equality comes in. And let's face it, even looking around the room, there's many more women here than there are men, and we need to find a voice that doesn't allow the few men that are here to be fast-tracked in their career while the rest of you sort of sit around hoping something's going to happen. Because that's what happens, lady. Because there's so few of them that they, they do generally get fast-tracked, and you will. So how do we, as the majority in this funny world that we occupy, actually uh, find a way for that to happen well for the men, <coughs> but also to happen for you? Because it's just numbers, isn't it? There's many more of you. Many more of you won't do as well as the few men that exist in the dance world. That needs unpacking, and it needs understanding if you're going to survive as a dancer. So for 21 Years, 21 Works, which is the programme we are working on at the moment, um, we focused on 21 productions or projects from 1994 until the, today. And I thought I'd use those 21 creations to whiz through them in half an hour um, to discuss the themes and issues and aesthetic approaches that forms the basis of how I make work. Does that sound OK? Yeah, are you with me so far? Yes. Are yeah. oh, you with me? Good. Okay, does anyone have any questions so far before I start launching into those 21 works? Or any comments? Yes. I'm just interested to know your training for the... Mechanism. I did an English literature degree uh, with drama. Uh, so I was acting or performing a lot at the university. And then me and four uh, other graduates from my English lit at Sheffield University course and drama my degree is English literature and drama. Um, I was also very sporty, by the way, so that's where the two worlds kind of started to collide. We formed a company called Cutback Theatre, which was a community theatre company based in Sheffield. And I did probably three, four years of working with people living with HIV and AIDS, uh, long-term unemployed people, people with special needs, um, uh, women in domestically violent relationships. So my formative years were driven by my left-wing politics and my desire to support uh, anti-violence, I suppose, against women. Um, and that is where I cut my teeth, but I always made work within those contexts. So I made work about um, incarceration and toured it around the whole prison system in the UK. Uh, the Arts Council asked me to write a directory about arts in prisons, which I did when I was based, that's when I lived in Leeds, actually, for a year doing that. Um, I became a bit of an expert at working in prisons because not many people were doing it. Um, I worked with a sculptor called Mish Weaver for um, sort of four or five of those years. Then I relocated to Newcastle to take up a position as community drama worker up in Northumberland, and we continued the work in prisons, and that one is when it really took off, and then we taught uh, a piece. Um, and then I started to dance with a company, a small company based in Sheffield called Sar by Sarno Dance Company. And at the same time, there were three or four other small companies that don't exist anymore. Whoopi Stomp was one. Um, Jane Morland and Rachel Liggett, I don't know if you know Rachel Liggett. She works with people with special needs now. They had another company called Ouch. Anyway, the three companies came together and formed a, 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 a cooperative called Dance Republic based in Sheffield. And we got a couple of quite well-known choreographers choreographers to come in and make work on us and we taught those work to to place to evolution and all that business. And then after two years of doing the, the cooperative and working for this other company, I seem to be doing a lot of the administration <laughs> and because I'm a natural leader, I was doing a lot of the leading and I thought, well, I might as well on my own. And that is when, in 1994, I said, let's, uh, let's do this. And so that's the potted history. 
but I fell into dance via trapeze. Uh, up in Newcastle, I started training in circus skills and did loads of aerial stuff. Um, the highlight of which was dressed in a sequined turquoise unitard on Brighton Seafront, <laughs> stepping in at the last moment to someone who injured themselves on a bungee. Well, that is a performance experience I wish never to repeat, <laughs> and it gives me th- <coughs> sort of goosebumps just thinking about it. Anyway, so I, I did. I sort of fell into the circusy scene for a bit, and then that got me really strong. That's why when I went into moving, I actually was the base for men and women uh, because I, uh, my upper body strength was much bigger than my lower body strength. Which is dancers, I think you tend to train your legs, and I had the opposite. I was like, really, come on. <laughs> um, and uh, that's sort of uh, why I've had two shoulder operations. Any other questions before I move on? Yes. I just had a question about you said um, you're really particular about like picking the objects that you work with. Yeah. Is it just things that sort of resonate with you, or are you really like conscious about like the choices that you make in terms of what the object says and could mean, and where, like how people can interpret it? Um, all of the above. I mean, I think what I'm trying to create is an environment, and I'll talk about this in a minute. An environment where things can happen that, that are more believable because you sort of know where you are. So if there's ten real trees in a space, then I can imagine maybe more clearly that I'm in a forest than if I'd. Um, made paper mache trees and painted them green, for example. Because I can sort of smell it and feel it and you can see that it's a real object. Um, Same with broken cords, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, 150 chapel chairs, you lay them horizontally, it looks like a church or a school hall or uh, an assembly or a political rally or whatever you want to call it. You do them this way, uh, it begins to look like some sort of ritual, uh, quite sort of Houses of Parliament. That, you know, if you change the space with the same objects, you can manipulate how you view the environment. But for me, the set design always comes first, because then I know what the performers are coming into. And usually I set up the space to indicate what's going to be sort of there. It might not be the full set, but the performers, when they turn up on day one of the devising process, are walking into something. We very rarely walk into an empty room. Because if we do walk into an empty room, like you do in a dance studio, you actually start gesticulating for no reason. <laughs> and you start sort of generating movement, and you don't know what your context is. So for me, the design is the context into which I'm asking people to enter. Then, as a performer, if I enter and that's a tree, I'm going to behave quite differently than if I enter and that's a chair or um, a fire or um, something cooking on a pot then my actions are going to start from a different place. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, so does that set design then come like from a preconceived idea yeah. of where you're heading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when you write a funding application, which I still have to do you know, for three years rather than the next project, the concept will always come from my head, like I said earlier, from where I'm at or what's interesting me at that time or what, what um, I'll always have an image in my head of, of uh, the next piece. And it should it's worth saying that the end of one piece is usually the beginning. I've said that time and time again. Lots of makers with a long history will tell you that. That you'll get to the end of one piece and you'll be really pleased or horrified by what you've made, and then you kind of go, right, I know that the next thing needs to pick up on that thread, or just that movement that Aurora did there, that's the beginning of something new, or that duet that we didn't quite flesh out, that can be the next thing. Does that make sense? Do that you mean each piece, like in the patterns for the next piece, or do you mean we find almost the because obviously that, in my own work, I'm very self-critical. So yeah. you kind of find the elements of the previous work that maybe you thought could be changed and take that into your next work. It's not a negative thing. I suppose what you're saying is, like, oh, that duet didn't work, then maybe I should rework it and yeah. start again. I know that's not quite what you're saying, but it's not quite that. It's more um, maybe a thematic thread. So, for example, with Motherland, there was a 12-year-old in it, and it was a minor part of Motherland, but... She was taking pictures of herself on her mobile. And because the piece was sort of about fertility and parenting and, and gender relations, and I didn't get too drawn into that moment with Leah and her phone and how uh, your generation, you digital native types, are dissecting your body with your digital technology and you're posting inappropriate shit um, online that is dangerous. And Leah, when she made the show with us, was 12. And uh, without talking about Leah, because it's not fair, but, but girls of that age, I did lots of workshops when we were on tour with Motherland, and I was utterly horrified by what young women are, A, putting up with, in terms of how men are circulating pornographic images of them uh, and their body parts, 
and also what they're doing to themselves by uh, disassociating from their flesh and bones and posting um, what I would say is completely um, infiltrated with porn, which I am against, um, uh, into the ether. So there were stories, I mean, I'll tell you more about that later, but there were stories that really horrified me. So that, and knowing what Leah has been through um, in her own life as a young woman and other young women that I know, that then becomes a starting point for the next show that I'll make next year, which is working with children of that age, and they'll be performing, not us. So I'm going to hopefully make a piece with seven kids and three adults, and they'll find their voice, and that's a big shift for me, because obviously I work with an ensemble of adults, uh, some of whom I've worked with for, for a very long time. But So that's what I mean, the end of one piece, something that hasn't quite grown or has had to be contained because the piece wasn't designed to be about that, but that has bubbled up, will be conceptually the next thing that I'll dig into. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's all going very well. So, um, 1994, Intercourse. A hard-hitting duet, full of sexual violence that draws on Andrew Dworkin's feminist diatribe. Read it. See what you think. I think now, more than ever, we need to draw attention to the inequality that prevails in our society that seems to be somehow reflected in the liberal context of the dance sector. Women still don't seem to make up or take up equal space. And so my questions as an artist, because I believe all art is political, is what values and expectations and conditions around women need to shift to let us in? Okay? Do women measure success in a different way to men? Or is it really more about how women present themselves? And I'm talking about how we present ourselves to promoters and the outside world. Are men just much better at relentlessly emailing promoters, much more tenacious about securing a slot in their diaries, more confident and discerning in their approach to marketing themselves? Is it just about ego? Are we conditioned from a very early age to be a little bit shy and a little bit humble? Um, why are we so behind in the dance world? Still fearful or upset or surprised by intelligent, robust, funny women who are not afraid to speak their mind? Is it simply a numbers game, as I said before, because there's actually just fewer men in the dance world. Men in the dance world are still a bit of a rarity and therefore more of a precious commodity. Getting more attention from their teachers during training and more offers of work as soon as they've finished. I'm guilty of this. I've employed men who are much worse dancers than w women because they're men, because I need a man in the show. I will never do that again. I would rather work with all women uh, who are really good. But that's what happens, because if you need, say, a heterosexual duet, you've got to find a man to, to do it. Now, I'm luckily now at the stage where I can employ, uh, I was going to say whoever I like, that sounds very grand, but I, I can invite people to join me, and they often say yes. So um, that's not such an issue for me now. But if you're really... You need to drill into that question. Would you rather employ a, a, a sort of crappy man or a really good woman? But if a good woman doesn't deliver the role that you need, then obviously you're not going to employ them. So that, that's a really, it's re I'm not being facetious, it's a real issue. And that's why you'll often see the same men going around all the companies, because there's not that many um, to go around. In my field, and I suppose I'm talking about the dance theatre, um, the dance theatre field. Um, is it? Uh, yeah. So, I spoke at a conference at Southern Wells about this, and um, during it, I asked, "Where are our feminist brothers in this debate?" Because I haven't heard one single male choreographer stand up and say this is an issue. Everybody knows that it is. So it's left to those uh, spiky women like me to stand up and make an issue out of it. And I will keep talking about it at any platform that I can until it changes, because that's what social activism is about. So, the first duet that I made with Harry, just leave it, it's fine, um, uh, in 1994 is, uh, was called Intercourse and it was based on Andrew Dworkin's, um, it's a diatribe, but it basically argues in the most simple terms that um, all sex is rape. That's actually not what it argued, but it's along those lines. So if you start to dig into that as a, as a, a theme, and then you, you have to address some of the issues around power, inequality and violence within male and female relationships. 1995, another duet, second early duet with Harry, which was me and him dancing together, punishing choreography, and again, woman as victim, but also partnering the man. So I was lifting Harry, Harry and um, carrying him around as much as he was 
me. And I suppose for me, the idea of partnering, if you think about it metaphorically rather than literally or physically, it is about how do we carry people through our lives. And as the leader of a company, you carry everybody, actually. And it's no surprise to me that I've had two shoulder operations because I'm carrying the weight of quite a big organisation. It's actually small in the scheme of things, but um, for me, it's quite a heavy weight to carry for, for a long time. As a metaphor, um, women, again, I think, have to ask themselves, what am I carrying and is it necessary? And uh, partnering, for me, as well as being physically joyous, and I like nothing, I, I did a lot of training in New York uh, once I realised that I wanted to be a dancer or, or, or dance more. I went off all over the place and, and did loads and loads of contact improvisation sort of workshops and stuff and got loads of um, awards to go and do stuff. And, and Harry taught me a lot actually about how to give and take weight. And I think the idea of giving and taking weight can act as a metaphor for equality. How do we share? How do we find an equal way of, of being together? So those two early duets uh, were an exploration of men and women, a man and a woman, um, heterosexual usually re relationship, and um, an exploration of giving and taking weight, I would say, and all the metaphors that that comes with. In 1996, I made a piece called Thonian Pleasures, which was a trio with your lovely teacher, Rachel Crichet, uh, where actually, for the first time, the violence within the work tipped over into the rehearsal room. We worked with a male performer who was actually quite aggressive. And we had to, um, I had to sort of take him out of the room several times. So that was a really interesting moment of art uh, being matched with life and how do you, as a leader, manage someone's aggression, uh, which was quite very unusual. I haven't come across that since. But that was the, also the first example of me being on the outside of the work and a really good example of how it started with a um, big circle of soil, sort of compost soil, that was very neat. And by the end of uh, quite an aggressive trio, the soil had sort of sprayed everywhere. So the image at the beginning transformed very simply by the end. And I think for me that's uh, an example of how space, the visuality of a space, can shift over the, the, the length of a show. So as I said before, the physical context sets the environment in which... <coughs> physical environment sets the environment and the context in which things can take place and soil or leaves or stones on the floor or trees hanging overhead has a huge effect on the kind of movement that is then created because if you've got to negotiate your way over 150 chairs say you're going to make very different kind of dance um, to uh, a dance if you're not trying to do that okay 1997 in Optimo City, uh, the almost perfect town, was a, a duet I made with T.C. Howard, who some of you might know. Um, and I think it was made as a, it's actually an R&D project, but it turned out okay, so we scored it. So it's a really good example of how somehow, sometimes research can lead nowhere, and sometimes a research project can kind of become a piece really quickly if you've got ideas that are strong and you're just following them. Um, this made me think about how much of a pressure there is now, uh, what's that, 20 years on, to share everything, not only through s digital media, as, as I've just described, but also through sharing. So I think when I started making work, there, there was this sense that maybe at the end of some R&D you might show something, but I think now everything is explicitly shared all the time, and I don't know how helpful that is. So I would just be, say to yourself, is it useful for me to share this right now? Because I think we're oversharing, actually. I think we're sharing stuff that isn't ready. I think we're sharing stuff and gathering feedback with the hope of making something better, which is always really useful because you're checking with your audience. But I think as a maker, you have to know what you're doing. And that's the challenge, I think. And you need to be your own audience as much as other people watching your work. So great to gather feedback, but don't rely on it too much, I would say. In 1998, I made a film. It's the only film, 35mm film I've made called Glass House. It's, sh it's showing upstairs, and at the end of this, we might all troll up and have a little look at the archive and engagement space upstairs. If it's only a 10 minute film. If you want to stand and watch it, you can. Um, it was made with uh, Richard Loden, who's a founding member of Force Entertainment, a Sheffield based, um, internationally renowned experimental theatre company, who also designed the set and went on to design my work for the next five or six years. And I suppose I wanted to just mention Glasshouse because a film gives you different perspective. There's a whole genre, I'm sure you study it, around dance for the camera. 
And I didn't go into it, because Richard's not a dancer, we didn't go into it, make it thinking we're going to make a dance for the camera piece, which was very much in vogue at the time that we made it. We just wanted to look at proximity and how you can get really close to an action when you're filming something and see it from many different angles rather than just end on like you do um, when you watch a piece of theatre. <clears throat> so video and film work, um, different form and a different result. And again, we've all seen you know, stuff that's just filmed back from back here, tiny figures, and obviously a camera or multiple cameras gives you much um, more access to the body and the choreography <coughs> and um, results in a completely different aesthetic. Digital distribution, that film actually has toured the world uh, um, for, for quite a long time, not, not anymore, but uh, in the four or five years after I made it. And um, it's making me wonder now with the advent of uh, the digital digital realm being so important in everybody's work that maybe that is one way forward now because you get a much wider distribution through digital means than you do through live touring circuits. And also, <coughs> excuse me, the touring circuit is on its knees in the UK, so um, we need to sort of address that um, and not uh, uh, and contemplate different models of distribution. Um, the house, the glass house from um, the film, went on to be recycled into a, a live installation work that was toured around galleries um, in 2000. And then a couple of years later, was also the platform on which we, in, on which we filmed um, another digital installation called Shifting Intimacies. Um, so the set that was designed for one thing was actually used three times in three different projects. Um, it's an example of some when you. When somebody designs something that's useful, it's good to hold on to it, store it in a shed somewhere, and it, you, it'll come back. Okay, so 1999, Falling from the High Rise of Love. Um, I suppose when I think about that piece, I think about character rather than heightened versions of self, because I think in that piece, um, I wasn't very clear about what I was doing in terms of, I think the, the five or six people that were in that show ended up playing slightly cartoon versions of themselves. And that's something that I've really left behind now in my own work, and I still see it in other dance theatre work, and it really turns me off now. So if I look back at my body of work, this kind of overstated, over-colourful, primary colour kind of approach is something that I'm, I've left behind. Um, I think I'm more interested in how performers can be vulnerable and virtuosic, um, but not abstracted, as I said before. And that's a sort of fundamental rule of my work. If it gets too primary colours, I really lose interest. Do you know what I mean by that or not? No? Yes? A bit overstated, a bit sort of, I'm going to pick this cup up from the table. Look at the cup. It's just like, yeah, just pick it up. Yeah? We, we have a saying in the company of like 101 things to do with a chair, which is ironic because I made a chair with 150 feet. I made a piece with 150 chairs in, but you know, if you start kind of going, oh, I can sit on the chair, I can lounge on the chair, I can jump up, it's like, oh, give it a rest. Just stop with the chair. What, what are you trying to say with the chair? Do you know what I mean? It becomes juggling. <laughs> and, um, that's okay if you like juggling, that's fine. Okay, um, I'm nearly there. Uh, 2000, on the house, uh, this was a live installation with the Spanish performer and TC again. Um, and this was looking at audience and proximity, because if you imagine a little gallery space this size, the glass house was sitting in the middle, there were loads of leaves around on the floor, and the action, the dance, took place in and out of the house. On, are you okay down there? Want to sit on a chair? You're cold. We're just yes. shutting the window. Should we shut those windows too? Don't want anyone to be cold. <laughs> Maybe the aircon has worked too. Is it cold now? I'm alright. Anyone else cold? You are cold. A little bit cold. They're dancers. Let's turn it off for God's sake. We're going to have injuries. Okay. So on the house was an installation with the same house as from Glass House, and the dancers moved in and around it, and the audience was sort of where you are. And that was really interesting for the two duettas because they'd have to negotiate. Um, the people that you weren't sitting down, they were standing up. And so it became a whole different ball game around how do I dance in amongst people. Um, and that was something I haven't done since, but it was very interesting as a, to take um, my work out of the proscenium arch um, arena and into a much more sort of art gallery context. 
Um, and it worked really well in that tour for quite a while. It gave, gave the work a new energy. And actually, the audiences really loved um, being that close to the action. And sometimes we had little toddlers running around in the middle of the performance and doddery old guys kind of getting in the way. And it was just like really interesting for a dancer working at full speed because they didn't slow down to actually negotiate everyone in the room. Um, 2000, I made a piece called Caravan of Lies. Uh, the theme in that show was of uh, performance as survival. It was sort of a bunch of circus performers stuck in a, a circus environment that they couldn't get out of. And um, it was a jaded, slightly abusive realm. And uh, for me, it was about exploring what, you know, if you've been touring for a while, what, what do you do next? Because it's really tiring touring. If any of you are interested in touring, it's absolutely knackering as a, as a life um, style. So we looked at that in there. Um, and it made me start thinking more and more, I suppose, about how to adapt the work that you make to really comment on where you're at with your performance career as well as the th the, this particular theme or specific thing that you want to discuss it in a piece of work. 2001, I made a piece called Drop Dead Gorgeous. This was a collaboration with a Polish dance company. I've been mentoring um, some Polish performers. I've been invited to the Baltic University of Dance to do some mentoring projects. That's where I met Aurora, who was making a solo, and Patrizia, who was in a, an improvised uh, duet. And I met uh, uh, Leszek Bzdl, who's the director of Dada bon von Bzlov Dance Theatre Company. Lots of Zs in that name. Um, and basically, I invited them to collaborate with three of us. So there were, again, TC, Pete Shenton from New Art Club and myself. Pete worked with me for a while. And we went to Poland and did some research there. It was a very sort of dark piece. It was about war um, and about um, the decimation of war, really. I read a lot of Primo Levi's work, which is about the annihilation of, of the Jews in World War II and the concentration camps. And for that reason, we performed in high heels on a tonne and a half of slate stone which was um, bad enough that when we went to Italy with the show, <laughs> they bought the wrong slate and it was really sharp, so we cut our legs to the smithereens, which gave it a whole new meaning. Um, but those are the kind of risks we were taking in those days of just, we're going to put three inch heels on and we're going to fall repeatedly on stones to sort of explore this, the, the, um, the, he the heftiness of the subject of, of um, the Holocaust and war. You okay? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so um, 2003, um, Let the Mountains Lead You to Love. I've got one thing to say about this, is that when you're in love, you make really shit work. So don't fall in love. Uh, it, was, it was frivolous, it wasn't dark enough. I look back on that and I think, what was I doing? A bit like that. So it's much better to be irritated and um, out of love all the time, I think. Um, 2004 marked our 10th anniversary. So 10 years, and again, I returned to the surface and inter interdisciplinary work with lots of proper dancing in. I thought, well, I've been making all this other stuff. I better make something to mark 10 years of moving as a company. Mm -hmm. And so we had a ballet solo in it by a man, a <coughs> ladies ballet solo in a tutu performed by a man. Um, we had lots of vaudeville, big jazz routines, because I just wanted to say, look, I can do this. I'm just not that interested in doing it. Lots of jazz hands. Um, some aerial work as a reference to where I'd come from. It was a really good fun piece and actually because the poster had Patrizia, who's very beautiful, she's got great legs, in fishnet tights, that was, guess what, the show that I made that sold the most tickets. <laughs> so there's a lesson in there because I fight marketing people all the time about I don't want a split leap on my poster, I don't want women's legs unless I'm taking the piss, which I was in that, that, in that particular uh, fishnet stockinged. Uh, image. So it's really interesting. It's an interesting question of, as women, how do we market our work and how do we market ourselves? Because believe me, put a beautiful woman in fishnet tights with high heels on a poster, a, 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 a wider range of clientele <laughs> turn up in the theatre. We had quite a lot of older men turning up to that show. Anyway, uh, so 2005, Broken Chords. Have we got Broken Chords? No. Um, so heartache makes good art. That's what I want to say to you. Um, anger, not beauty. Uh, sorry, anger. I didn't want to make an angry piece. I was getting divorced. Um, and I wanted to make something beautiful. And I wanted to mention this piece to you and talk about it a little bit because it was a sort of seminal piece of mine. You're probably all too young to have seen it. But it's probably the piece that made the biggest impact um, 
in my career that shifted me from being a smaller scale artist to a middle scale, um, getting taken really seriously on the middle scale. And it toured for about four years and it went to Germany and America and, and Italy and various other places. So it was, it was a very successful piece. Um, I've recently been described as a close, by, by the observer, as a close spectator of my own life, which I thought was a really interesting phrase, turning aspects of my own experience into theatrical truths. So how to produce something in a time of depletion and depress, uh, uh, distress? How to find a poetic lightness in all of this dark? How to remain visible when the fundamental need is to disappear? How to avoid being swallowed up with fear? How to find a voice in a time of silence and suppressed emotion? How to start breathing again when you not, haven't come up for air for months? Broken Chords is two pieces in one. It's a fictional abstract dance that, that describes the dark side of love and loss and defeat. And then a series of interruptions where the performers rebel against the director, that would be me, um, to save the work from its own self-indulgence. So the whole thing starts as this really beautiful, moody, lyrical thing. And then TC, actually, who left the company shortly after this, sort of stands up and said, that, that, you know, we've got to stop this. The director's having a terrible time. You know, it's just all too depressing. She doesn't say it like that. She's much more cleverly than that. But it was, for me, um, quite British humour, really, that I'm sending myself up. I'm making this piece. I can't make any other piece at that time in that particular moment in my life. It's a beautiful piece, but it's dark, but it also needs to be sent up. So these two things um, run in parallel, and the performers keep uh, finding moments of mutiny against what I've asked them to do. And that was all very well until TC left the company and I performed my own, her role in it. So I ended up rebelling against myself, which was very postmodern, as I'm sure you would rather both be in. Um, so in Broken Chords, performers slide in and out of the action, and we make transparent the things in the show that don't work as part of the show. And we fragment the choreography as a metaphor for the fragmentation of a life. And there's no narrative structure. Um, we give space around the things that take place um, in the piece, and we spend time watching and witnessing each other um, from the stage, on the stage. And with most of my work, you sort of come on stage and you stay on stage until it's over. There's not many entrances and exits, apart from the motherland, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the work begins and ends with a dazed woman making her way blindly across the stage, uh, metaphorically and physically struggling to stay on her own path and rediscover her own centre. And as one of the performers put it after performing that, moving along the edges of a place with no middle, slowly, step by step, finding our way. 2005, I made a piece called Shifting Intimacies, which I mentioned before, uh, which brought together um, two Australian artists called Keith Armstrong and Guy Webster. Guy is a sound artist and Keith is a, a, a computer, um, well, he's a digital artist. And together we, for the ICA in London, made this piece where you go into a space on your own. There's a raised circle um, on the floor with TC um, moving around around in circles like a sort of like a, a naked baby, but very beautiful, athletic baby, with a sort of umbilical cord that's swimming with her in the, in the juice in the video. And you go into the space on your own, and as you walk through the space, you, you're triggering um, the soundtrack. So there's sensors across the space that as you walk through them, um, each soundtrack of each person that goes in will be different because you're triggering different sounds. Um, there's a, a computer software thing called the Very Nervous System that was used in setting up this space. And then you walk up onto a platform and you cast, um, I think it was salty, uh, flowery type substance into the space. And it, the whole thing is a little bit like a burial, a self-burial, and a birth at the same time. So that was another example of a kind of art installation piece that had movement at its core, but your experience of it was not, again, an end-on piece of theatre. 2006, I made Fairy Tale, which was a children's work. <coughs> um, and it's the only children's work that I've made and uh, really explored, it was sort of like Stig, in the, Stig of the Dump meets um, dance, really. And um, lots of object manipulation, lots, lots of song, lots of silly dancing. And that was made for six to eight year olds. And we toured that quite widely. 2006, made a piece called Testron, which was probably the most explicit coming together of live music and dance, which was basically two violinists battling to create a soundtrack with Janusz in a very small performance area dancing. And the whole 
show became about what's leading. Is the, is the live music leading the dance or is the dance leading, leading live music? And basically, he's whipped up into such a frenzy that he actually has a, a breakdown and has to stop the show again uh, because he can't keep up. And that's the first time that really uh, Patrizia used a loop station. We worked with a guy called Matt Howden, who's quite famous actually abroad with his um, band, which is him, called Zeban. <coughs> And he uses one violin, but he's looping, so he's grown a whole orchestral sound with just one violin and breath. And we explored that with the two of them together, and it was really, really exciting. We made that dance umbrella in 2006. Um, and since then, I've pretty much only... Um, in Broken Chords, I work with a cellist and a live violinist, and since then, those two instruments have been with me in pretty much everything that I've made. Apart from uh, Look At Me Now, Mummy, which is happening on Friday tomorrow night, which is, was made in 2008 as a solo by Aurora, eight months after she'd had her first child. And when you have children, it, it alters everything in terms of how you live and uh, the kind of work you want to make and how you carry yourself, how your body feels. Um, and so we made this piece, which is um, Aurora lost in a sort of world of domesticity, not really coping very well. And she's using a, a performative language to try and lift herself out of it, but she keeps failing. And then there's a sort of live birth on stage towards the end of it. So if you fancy seeing that come along on Friday, 7.45 upstairs. Um, 2008, we're getting close to 2015. You all right to keep going? Do you need me to stop? Is it interesting or not? Yeah. Yes, okay. People are falling asleep at the front here. I always take that as a good sign. But either they have a good night out or I'm really boring them. Um, 2008, Double Vision, my first collaboration with Liz Agis. Anyone know Liz's work? Yeah. She's fierce, she's brilliant. She's one of my best mates. She's 63, 64 now, she's still going strong. She's amazing. Um, <clears throat> how do we give value to maturity on stage? You're very young, this is probably not a question for you at the moment, but it'd be good to think about it as you age. Um, how do we give value to the aging, fleshy body of middle age in a culture preoccupied with such a limited view of what makes a body beautiful? Um, I think that was the starting point of um, making Double Vision. I'll just read a little bit more about it. It started with an empty space and a shared determination between Liz and I to make something together, because we just really like each other, and we met um, in a choreographic residency with Jonathan Burroughs up in Findhorn near Inverness, which is a place where they grow very large vegetables. Um, despite our differing aesthetic and physical practice, what brought us together was a desire for a new language and something interesting to say about uh, having a combined age of performance of 96 years old. <laughs> um, so working on equal terms, we collaborated to make um, Double Vision. And we based our dance vignettes around the rhythmical structures of the Queen of the Night aria from Mozart's opera, The, the Magic Flute. So everything we did was rhythmically connected to that aria, which was, I hadn't really worked like that before, and I heard Liz. And the, the resulting work sits somewhere between live art and dance, and it's a kind of female Morecambe and Wise doing a bit of self-penned Beckett. And it also, which was an interesting shift again for me, explores the relationship between the director and the performer, between the conceptual, comple conceptual complexity and physical simplicity, and between seriousness Dead, de Liz and I are deadly serious about our work, but it's also funny. So what we naturally find together is kind of wit. And we're both, I haven't said this yet, but a lot of my work is much funnier than it sounds. It's a dark British humour, but it's actually quite good fun. It sounds very serious when I describe it, in the way that I've described it, but that's what people um, enjoy about it, I think. Um, anyway, we toured Double Vision, and with it, just as, a, as another thought, we toured a scripted conversation as the second half of a double bill which was Liz and I talking about how we made the, the work. And that, that worked really well because it, it allowed us to look at age and beauty and performance and creativity and humour um, as part of a script between us. So we did the show and we finished that, we had an interval, and then we sat on the edge of the stage and we talked about the process, but it was scripted, so it was another sort of performance. And then right at the end, we opened it up to Q&A. So it's a really interesting format, which we'd like to, to, to do again, I think. Well, we have done it in the sense, but not the script conversation bit. Anyway, um, next one, 2009, if we go on. Things that drove that were risk, annihilation, 
nihilism, experiment, failure. Uh, I wasn't willing to compromise at all at that point. I'd reached a really sort of intellectually stubborn moment and I just went, I'm just going to make a piece, I'm going to make it differently. I worked over 16 weeks, which I've never got done before. I challenged myself to only ever have three of the six, was it eight or six, six performers in the space at any one time. Sorry, two, so we had two, 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 two. And it went on for, Christ, three months, the making process, the worst idea I've ever had. <laughs> By the end of it, I was uh, absolutely mad. Um, and the other thing to say about that was that um, it sort of took me into an existential void, really. And by then, my partner and I had lost uh, five pregnancies and uh, through miscarriage and an ectopic pregnancy, which is life-threatening. So I'd sort of been close to the void myself and come back again. Well, actually, no, we haven't come back. I was still in that sort of dark place. And um, when I made If We Go On, I'm happy to share this with you, I was taking fertility drugs that made me absolutely bonkers. So I look back on that now, um, and I look at the drugs and what they were doing to me, and um, I was in a sort of state of madness as I was making it. I made really bad choices, but I think the work's really <laughs> extraordinary work when I look back on it. And it's one of the most controversial pieces that I've ever made. It absolutely divided people. A British dance edition, about 300 of the 500 promoters that came to see it walked out. Um, and I was at the back doing the sound, and the, the sound of chairs flopping up as all the promoters left. And I was just at the back going, what's going on? This is really exciting and also completely terrifying. My career is over, I thought. Uh, but it wasn't, because the Arts Council thought it was really great. I'd been that divisive. Hurrah! So here I am. I'm still here. Um, <clears throat> and also, the chief executive of one of the major, I wonder if you can guess which one it is, the major, if not the major, dance house in London, came up to me afterwards and said, are you all right? <laughs> which at the time made me really furious, but I also realised now that I actually wasn't all right. So it was quite a kind question, but I doubt that he would have asked a male choreographer for that. He probably would have just bought a pint and left it. So, interesting, um, I, don't, I don't think he would have asked that of a, of a man. Because at that time I wasn't prepared to say to him, no, I'm not all right, and this is why, because it's none of your business, because it's private. I can talk about it now. Um, but I just wonder about that, how you're treated as a woman, uh, if you make a piece that is um, uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. Uh, 2012, Traces of Her. Um, I made a piece with Claire MacDonald. If you don't know about Impact Theatre Cooperative, who were based in Leeds in the 80s and 90s, look them up. They have influenced every single piece of experimental theatre or dance that you will see. They were in turn influenced by the Wust Group. That's the heritage. If you're interested in experiment, look up Impact Theatre. Claire MacDonald, who lived up here for a while and then in York and um, now lives in London, um, and I collaborated on uh, a piece that looked at memory <clears throat> and the traces of performance that you carry in your body if you performed a piece over and over again. By that point I'd stopped performing but what I had, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Stan's Caff in Birmingham, it's an experimental theatre company, look them up if you haven't. Um, in the millennium they restaged a seminal piece of work called The Carrier Frequency which was made in 1984 I think and that was Impact Theatre's um, piece. And it's set in a pool of water, and it's again sort of post, um, feels like it's post nuclear burnout. The, the, the text is by Russell Hoban, the novelist. And Stan's Caff um, staged this piece and asked me to be in it. And I and various people from various companies um, staged it in Birmingham for the millennium. Claire saw me perform that, and from that moment had this idea that I'd stepped into her role that she had played. 10, 15, 15, 20 years before. And so we had this idea of what does it mean to step into someone's devised role? Because a devised piece isn't like playing the fifth. It doesn't, it's not existing until you make it. So you sort of own it. And I have to say, in my own company, the first time I ever had to replace a performer, I absolutely filled me with dread. Because well, how can I replace them? They made that. And actually now I do it all the time. Because <laughs> I'm less precious about it and I understand the craft and but um, Claire and I were interested in how we make time disappear behind us. What is evident? How do we evidence dance? Because I do this and then the gesture's gone and you'll never see it like that again. What's left? Is it a trace in the air? Is it a trace on your eyeballs? Is it a feeling? I mean, I'm not talking about capturing it through digital means and video. What's left? How do you hold on to it? Um, and I have to say, as you get older and you, you <coughs> develop a body of work, that actually becomes a really important question. How do I 
do I leave any legacy? What's he going to say on my gravestone? She was a bit hard. <laughs> she made bad jokes. I mean, what's he going to say? Or is there going to be a body of work, an archive of work that I can leave? I, it's, it's not my impetus to leave a body of work, but you do start thinking about that when you've been making stuff for a long time. Because you're very careless as makers. You just sort of do it. There's so many experiences I could tell you about that were extraordinary, but I can't remember them. There's no record of them. Um, and I don't know what I feel about that now, really. So we know that we disappear at the moment that it becomes possible to record ourselves and listen to the voices of the dead. And we know this melancholic state because it's attached to dying and um, leaving no trace. So Claire and I made a piece called Traces of Her, which was part of Juncture, actually, that I curated here a couple of years ago. And then finally, to final two, 2012 Motherland. If a few of you have seen it, I won't need to talk about it much, but um, I think it's worth saying <coughs> that uh, in 2012, Motherland was born. It's about the territory that we occupy as women as m and men. It's about the body as a site where life is played out on the surface and deep inside the organs. Um, Motherland is full of blood and earth and explores motherhood and childlessness and the gendered experiences subtly and very explicitly over two hours. It's the longest thing I've ever made. And I was determined that it would be as long as it needed to be, and it needed to be two hours. And I don't care if venue promoters think that too long, that's too long, because there's no interval. Because I don't think it is, and that's my judgment. Um, it's full of entrances and exits, which is something we've never done before. The whole piece is based on coming in to, a, to an empty space and creating something and then stopping it and going off again. And so your experience as the, as the audience is trying to piece together um, some kind of narrative, some kind of sense, some kind of meaning out of these fragments. And what it holds as a piece is a multiple layers of repetition. Um, things are repeated over and over again, and they shift a little bit or they remain the same. But hopefully what builds up is a very complex and layered picture of um, five women, including a child, and five men, um, finding ways to be together in space. It's um, a critique, as I mentioned earlier, of uh, vacuously plastic, over-sexualized images of girls and women, which I take offense to, um, untouched by age, injury, or pregnancy, and explores the spectrum of masculine to feminine, questioning how women take up space, find a voice, and make some noise. And the piece had a 12-year-old girl, girl in Leah, and a 79-year-old woman in, um, and a cast of eight other people, and raised some questions that I think are still lingering for me, as I said before. We've got a little clip of it, which I'll show you now, just to remind you, and then we are nearly done, and we can have a Q and A session. Let me lose my mind. I haven't talked this much for about a year and a half. <laughs> And um, this is based around the song that the women um, that the women sing in the show. Okay. So that's the set. Those are the lovely performers. Brilliant cast. <coughs> and these are um, very difficult to walk in. These shoes. They're upstairs. If you want to try them on. <coughs> And we had a running joke that Aurora had lost. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I was giggling to that because it's funny when you haven't watched something for a couple of years and then you watch it, you go, God. Yeah. So I need to be strong, pretty but fierce, a virgin and a whore. I need to look easy but not that easy, like I know what I'm doing, but I may need some help. I need to earn my own living, but not earn more than him, because that's a threat to his masculinity. I need to be available, but not too available. And so it goes on and on, with all the contradictions of roles that we as modern women spend so much time trying to engage with and negotiate. The personal is political. Our art can be political. The way we live our lives, the way we lead, the way we function, the way we make offers into the world, the contributions that we make, the voices that we have, we could change the way we do things for the better. We could move towards equality, couldn't we? And I think as dance leaders and as dance teachers and as artists and as people, we have some responsibilities. We need to bring greater awareness to the important issues affecting women worldwide. I'm comfortable with the label feminist, and I'll be interested later to find out if there are any of you are. When um, the definition of feminism is to seek equality and justice for women and the end of all sexism in all forms. That's all it means, guys. It's not very scary. To defend equal political, economic and social rights for girls and women and to demand the end of violence to all girls and women. That's all we're talking about. So I think as a final comment, that the effect on motherhood, uh, of motherhood on female choreographers remains the most significant explanation as to why we are working in, more, in smaller and more flexible and more invisible ways than men. Um, Motherland was a bit of a two fingers up to the system as well as a very personal piece. Um, how can the dance ecology that we're all part of, that you will become part of when you leave your institution, um, how can we make the two creative tasks of making a baby or having a child and making work live happily in tandem? It's almost an impossible equation with the way things are set up at the moment. All art is political. All artists should be imagining a way, uh, it, it should be imagining a society in which women and men have equal access to opportunity at home and at work and in the public life. And as long as those of us who have kids hide it, or those of us who are in positions of um, having a voice, don't talk about it. The issues, the invisibility of what, what um, women go through to parent and work remains. Um, having a kid alters everything, as I'm sure some of you may find out. Um, final 21 then, 21 years, 21 works. We've chosen to restage Aurora's solo, look at me now, mummy. Um, and we've also re -chosen, chosen to restage a big ensemble piece that was made with Phoenix across the road in 2012 as part of the Cultural Olympiad um, project. I was commissioned by Phoenix on the Canvas project. I don't know if any of you were here in Leeds at that point, but um, in 2012, to make uh, a piece for Under Leeds Station in the Arches. Did anybody see it? Was anyone around? So it's the first time I've worked with Phoenix with their new ensemble, and we made a piece um, in their studio, but the, the arch that I made it in Under Leeds... Um, railway station was a really long thin arch and um, we worked, we were sort of inspired or asked to be inspired by the Quay Brothers work and their experimental filmmakers and they curated the whole festival. Look it up, it's called Underwor Overworlds and Underworlds and it was a massive project and there's um, a big website, there's an interactive website that you can go on, but Yorkshire Dance and Northern Ballet Theatre and Phoenix and I don't think Northern or Leeds Beckett were involved, were they? Leeds Beckett were, yeah. 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 Oh yeah, Rachel did, yeah, Rachel yeah. did a solo as part of the Overworld yeah. bit. Gary Clark did a piece. Um, uh, Northern Ballet guy, I've forgotten his name. De he, did, he made a piece. Um, and um, Dougie Thorpe made a piece. And I made a piece in the, in the tunnels. It was really extraordinary. 10,000 people came through um, over three days. That was a lot of people to see your work. And anyway, for my 21st anniversary, because it was only put on for three days, I thought I'd restage it. Three of the original Phoenix dancers who have since left Phoenix have come back to join me, um, Azura, Phil and Josh. And we've just remade it with uh, two independent uh, dancers called uh, Tony Grove, who runs Pro Dance Theatre, and um, Sylvia Mercurali, who's, uh, Mercuriali, who is a, a live artist, and three of my usual, um, sorry, four of my usual performers. 
So we just opened that in Shoreditch Town Hall, along with Look At Me Now Mummy, along with the Archive Engagement Space, and along with Glass House, which is also upstairs. And that collection, plus a whole new load of stuff that we put online on my website, that you, after this you might be interested in looking at, is the live and online collection that makes up for 21 years, 21 works. Um, what I really loved about doing the thing under the, the um, arches was that it was quite a big event and it felt like I'd been offered, sorry to bang on about this, but as a female crowfoot, offered a, a really great platform to show that I can work on that scale. It's not a problem. Um, and I really like the work. So I have got more to say, but I think I'm going to stop there because it's uh, moving towards the time that I think we should open up the discussion a bit. Um, but just to summarise, that the next, if there are a next 21 years or a next three years, even, then the things that will drive me will remain around. Um, equality around new methods of distribution, not just live touring. We're moving more into the digital realm. My website has now got uh, interviews that uh, our development officer has done with me around these 21 works. There's user-generated content that's been um, generated in their workshops that Caroline and Sean are running all over the place. Um, if you want to stay after three or, or quarter three or whenever, then have a little go at some of the tasks upstairs, watch the film if you've got time, if not, come back. There's an open session tomorrow, I think, at 5, 5.30, if you want to come back. I really hope some of you can come and see Aurora perform tomorrow night, because she's exquisite. She's absolutely phenomenal. She's been doing four-hour versions of this show. The, the one that we're doing tomorrow night is only 40 minutes with post-show discussion. But she's been working on a durational loop as part of this 21 years, so the whole piece is sort of growing. It's really interesting. Um, and just to sort of say, um, which I haven't mentioned at all, that Vincent Arnsitter is a, is a parent-friendly company now. Um, so many of us have got children that we're the... I've been supporting women coming back to work for quite some time, and um, I talk about that because I don't think, again, it's talked about much, that it's really difficult to tour with kids, and we've been supporting Aurora and other people to tour with their children and their families for quite a long time, because it's the only way for those women not to drop out of the landscape and it's the only way to stop the landscape being dominated by young women and gay men, uh, because I think mature uh, mothers need a voice in the dance landscape. And it's only people sticking their neck out and talking about it that will change that. So it becomes the norm for there to be a childcare budget in your big budget, for example. Um, and then finally, we are not only exploring new digital ways, but also new partners. So in this um, tour that we've been doing, that ends in Brighton Festival in a few weeks' time. Um, we've been looking for new partners outside of the dance set because the, the, the Arts Council and all the cuts are really hitting now. So everything's becoming very pinched. Venues haven't got as much money. Companies haven't got as much money. Um, it, it's quite hard work at the moment. Um, and so we're looking at um, partners like the WOW Festival, the Women of the World Festival, where we did look at the Now Mummy the other day. It's an extraordinary event. Go if you can. It's brilliant. Um, Maybe Routledge, the publishers, BBC, um, Goldsmiths, Brunel University, um, social services. We're, we're looking back outside the dance world for people to come in as partners around, say, this new girls project that I'll do. And that's quite exciting because in a way, and to complete my talk, it almost takes me full circle to where I began, which is in the community, which is the real place. And from that real place can come all sorts of fantastical artworks, but I would say keep feet on the ground and remain engaged with the issues that drive our society as well as um, our dance world. Because if you only ever look inside the dance world, you're really just looking uh, nowhere. It's not enough. So on that positive note, <laughs> I will finish talking, I thank you, and we will open the floor to any questions.